come to aquifer recharge gardens, or as some people call them, rain gardens. I am Lily Browning. I work for Hernando County Utilities in the Water Department, and my program is Florida Friendly Landscaping. My email, if you would like to talk to me, is lilyb, L-I-L-L-Y-B, at hernandocounty.us. These are the nine principles of Florida Friendly Landscaping. And we're gonna to concentrate today on our rain garden program or aquifer recharge gardens with principle number eight, reduce stormwater runoff. This program is an add-on program to uh, the program I did just yesterday called rain harvesting. In it, we discussed many ways to hold water in your landscape, which is beneficial for your landscape, as well as uh, good for the environment because we are reducing stormwater rent runoff and preventing pollution from entering our waterways. Well, let's really get into rain gardens and how they work and how we can have one. So why, why should we use a rain garden or as I like to call them, aquifer recharge gardens because that is basically what they are. They increase the amount of water that filters into the ground, recharging groundwater supplies. They provide protection from flooding for your yard and drainage problems. They do protect streams, lakes, and rivers from the pollutants that storm water runoff would take to the nearest waterway. They channel water away from structures, and it is also a wildlife habitat. Basically, a rain garden is a depressed area, a depressed garden that you create that you stop stormwater runoff from leaving your property. When it is raining and the rain comes out of your gutter, you wanna see where it's going. And then you just wanna halt it before it goes down the driveway, out into the street. And we're gonna talk about ways to do that. Here's a graphic that shows basically what a rain garden does. Um, Based on studies, rain gardens have the ability to filter approximately 40% of metal pollutants that come off of your roof and those roof shingles. Also automobile fluids and soil. Approximately 15% of nitrogen from fertilizers, pet waste and organic matter can be filtered by rain gardens as well. So as I said, we will see the rain, how it comes down our gutter and where it is going in the yard. And that is where you want to stop it. Um, you will build, you will dig into your yard and we'll get into exactly how far, how many inches, it has a lot of factors there. And then you're going to create a berm that will stop the water from leaving your property. And you put in, this says native plants, native plants are great. They're wonderful, good, useful. And but you can also use non-native Florida friendly plants that um, do fine with wet feet or dry feet, depending on what's going on with the weather. Now the functions of a rain garden, as I said, it'll recharge the local aquifer by increasing the amount of water that filters into the ground. And as we mentioned, it reduces the amount of urban pollutants that might get carried away by stormwater runoff. We stop it in the yard, we let it filter through the ground and filter out a lot of those pollutants. And in so doing, it's gonna be beautiful, add curb appeal to your landscape and provide habitat for birds, butterflies and beneficial insects and pollinators. So the elements of a rain garden, there you would have a diverse mix of flowering plants, sedges, rushes, and grasses. Native plants are always a great choice because native plants um, are adapted to our different rainfall patterns here in our state. Consider bloom time. What does that mean? That means you might want to have different uh, flowering plants in your rain garden that flower at different times of the year so that you always have that visual interest going on. Also have mixed heights, shapes, and textures. 
to add to that, not only that visual interest for you, that is what is going to attract uh, the pollinators and the birds and the hummingbirds and all of that. Mulch, you can use mulch, but don't go too heavy on the mulch. Um, and you can also use as mulch composted yard debris and leaves as it would be in the forest. And you can add rocks and stones and gravel, but don't fill up the entire uh, bottom of your rain garden with that. Just use it for interest to add texture and to slow the water down, but also add that visual interest and beauty. So where are we gonna put this rain garden? We want it at least 10 feet from the house so that the water doesn't seep into the foundation. You want it to look good and to integrate into your existing landscape. Um, put it next to, to where you gather, where you have outdoor gatherings that will always you know, be a pleasant place to sit and, and enjoy it. You don't wanna put it over a septic tank or a drain field or under a large tree because you want it to be in full or partial sun. You want to encourage additional water filtration in your yard. If you already have a low spot that already collects water, you already basically almost have a rain garden there and you can utilize the plants that we're going to discuss, put in plants there. But the purpose of building a rain garden is to add another location that will stop the water from leaving your yard. Rain garden should be at least, as we said, 10 feet from the house on a gentle slope that catches water from the downspout. Um, size and shapes, kidney is the most common kidney shape um, or teardrop shapes as well. The size of the garden is gonna depend on the type of soil that you have, the size of the roof and the lawn area that is draining to that area and the depth of the rain garden. Before you start digging, you always wanna call 811 so they can come out and perform what they call line locates to make sure that you're not uh, turning off your neighbor's cable or electric or anything that might you know, cause a problem in the neighborhood. So let's talk about soil. We mentioned soil, so let's talk from the ground up what we need to start thinking about. If you happen to have clay soil, which many of you don't, but some of you in the more um, inner parts of the state, even more uh, Eastern in our county of Hernando, the further, are, the further you are away from the coast, the more chances that you might actually have some clay soil. Well, that is the slowest rate of drainage type soil. So those gardens are gonna to have to be larger to make up for the, the fact that it doesn't drain all that well as sand. And if it is just really, really clayey gumbo, you know, really thick clay, that is not the right location for your rain garden. Sandy soil, which many of us have, that soaks in the quickest and you can have a smaller rain garden. So the larger the drainage area, the larger the garden. If there, you have a very, very large roof area and a lot of water is coming to that area, again, you're gonna to wanna to have a larger garden. So calculating the drainage area. 10 to 30 feet from a downspout, almost all of the water comes from the roof. So you calculate the portion of the roof that drains into the garden. More than 30 feet from the downspout, you have to measure the length and width of the lawn and add it to the roof area. So this example that they're showing you here, say your house is 60 feet long and 40 feet wide. So to calculate, your roof area at 60 times 40, you have 2,400 uh, square feet for your roof. So you estimate that a certain downspout collects water from a quarter of that 2,400 square feet. So to calculate the drainage area, that's 2,004 feet times 0.25. So you are getting it from 600 square feet. 
A 600 square foot, por square foot portion of the roof drains into that one rain garden. And if your lawn is sloped, there's other examples that you'll need to, you'll need to dig down deeper. So it's typical to dig down four to eight inches. The ground surface of the garden should be level. The slope of the lawn or the slope of your yard determines the depth of the garden. The you know, steeper the slope, the deeper the garden. And how are we going to figure out the slope? You know, many, many of us think we are perfectly uh, level here in Florida, but maybe not. So how are you going to calculate that? One stake at the highest point and a second stake at the low point, about 15 feet away, because generally that is how um, wide uh, our garden may be. Get a carpenter's string level, a carpenter's or a string level, Measure the distance between those two stakes. Measure the height from the ground to the string on the downhill stake right there. So the horizontal distance of the string between the stakes, say it's 180 inches. The string's vertical height on the downhill stake, let's say it's nine inches. So you divide the height by the horizontal distance between the stakes, multiply by 100 to find your lawn's percentage slope. So here we have 180 inches wide divided by nine inches in height, and that's 0 0.05, so we have a 5% slope. And it tells you right here, the percent of your slope is how deep you should dig down. If you have less than a 5% slope, Five inches deep is good enough. If it's five to seven, six to seven inches deep, seven to 12 inch slope, about eight inches deep. And you can go from there. Now, what about that surface area? Using both the slope and area drainage calculations. So you're, again, we're saying if your lawn has a 5% slope, you are going to have a six inch deep rain garden. Let's say your uh, soil is silty and your rain garden is 10 to 30 feet from the downspout. So what we did before, remember the size factor of 0.25 is recommended. You multiply the downspout area, which was 600 square feet by 0.25 to find the recommended rain garden area of 150 square feet. So, <laughs> As you can see here, you can look at the tables and figure out all the rest of the size factors with the depths as well. And if you, as always, when watching my programs, if you would like a PDF of this, because this is gonna be very hard to keep in your head, I will be glad to send you a PDF copy of this presentation. Just email me at lillyb, L-I-L-L-Y-B, at hernandocounty.us and just say, I'd like a PDF copy of the rain garden presentation, please. And here's what the shape usually is, ends up being this kidney shape. You see where the downspout is up here. The long side of the garden should face uphill and the garden should be longer than it is wide. So choose a width that fits the area. 10 feet is typical, not usually more than 15 feet. It should be wide enough for the water to spread evenly across the whole bottom of the surface and provide enough space for a variety of plants. The thing you don't wanna do is go to all this effort to create the space and then put one type of plant in there or even just three varieties of plants you want great variety to attract that wildlife, to have that different texture, shapes, sizes, and also the different bloom times. So to determine the length of the garden, choose a rain garden width that's suitable. Say it's 10 feet. Divide the square footage of your garden by its width to find your garden's length. 
Again, you want a rain garden that, that is 10 feet wide. If you did so, divide 150 square feet by the 10 foot width to calculate your garden's length. The length is going to be 15 feet. Now digging into that rain garden, dig the depth of the garden at the uphill stake. Maintain the same depth across the bottom. And when you're digging, so you pile that dirt on the low side to create your burn. Keep that string there to help you keep it all even. The burn should be as high or slightly higher than the uphill edge. Compact the soil in the berm by tamping hard down, and then have gently sloping sides and plant to integrate the rest into the surrounding garden. Here are some things that you don't want to do. Um, well, this, this is a very complicated uh, rain garden. This is great if you want to get to this level of engineering. That's fine, but what we're pointing out that should not be done is the tree um, in the rain garden. Tree is going to um, soak up <laughs> all the water and um, all you'll have is a tree in a hole. Basically there you won't um, accomplish having a rain garden and rain gardens should be out in the sun to you know, let all those wonderful plants grow well. So um, trees are fantastic and they do soak up um, a lot of uh, the water out of your landscape, which is a good thing that helps us, that helps it from turning into stormwater runoff. But as far as for a rain garden, we don't include trees in the rain garden. This uh, lets you think about for a while what may be the problem with this rain garden. It's beautiful, isn't it? It looks, you know, like things were done pretty well. I'll, I'll let you know right now, structurally, nothing wrong with it. You know, really good rain gar um, garden. Here's the issue. Most likely these people did not do this on their own property because that area right there um, is called the right of way that belongs to your municipal um, entity, whether that be a county or a city uh, or a township or whatever it is not your property. So even though there's a swale already built in there, um, the municipal entity may come along and just mow it all down because it is their property and they're used to mowing there and then all your um, efforts will be wasted or they may actually, you know, be uh, not happy that you, you may be blocking some kind of drainage system, uh, you know, a ditch system that they are trying you know, to have for the city. So as wonderful as this looks and as great as this might be, save yourself a lot of trouble and you know, make sure that you are building this rain garden in your own property and not on the municipal um, right of way. This is gorgeous <coughs> and there is nothing at all wrong <laughs> with uh, building a dry creek bed that leads to your rain gardens that's done many times adds beauty to the whole thing and you can see the water comes out of the downspout and goes down this dry creek bed and is beautiful but has anybody caught on yet as to why it's something I would probably discourage well it looks like they may have tried something to stop it here but it looks to me like it's just going straight down the driveway and back into the road and becoming stormwater runoff. So, you know, it's not, maybe this would be absolutely beautiful if they stopped the dry creek bed around here, maybe created some kind of, oh, more of a uh, rain garden right here. To me, this looks like they're descending a very beautiful way of sending stormwater runoff right back into the street. So, you know, think out your plans. And certainly if you have the resources and the desire to create these dry creek beds that lead to the rain gardens, do that. But what we are trying to 
stop in this whole endeavor is we're trying to stop that water from leaving our property. Now let's talk about some of the plants that we can use in these gardens. You want plants that thrive in full sun. And as I said before, that can tolerate dry to wet conditions. Low maintenance would be very helpful. Now we're gonna use this for several purposes. One of them is attracting wildlife and the other is to filter pollutants out of that rainwater. Therefore, we do not wanna add chemicals into this rain garden. Your rain garden should be a chemical free zone, free of fertilizers, insecticides, herbicides, any of that. And again, it's not the place for trees. So let's talk, just, you know, get an idea of some of the plants that might work out in your rain garden. This cinnamon fern is a native, great idea to use, two to um, five feet tall, three to four feet wide. Any of the milkweeds? <clears throat> well, the tuberosa, let me uh, retract that. Any of the native milkweeds. Um, the tuberosa uh, might not like it when it's very, very wet. That tends to like very dry areas. So you might want to save the tuberosa, not for your rain garden, but for elsewhere in your yard that may be drier. These two, Perennis and Incarnata, are actually swamp milkweeds. And these three natives are um, as much as any natives are commercially available, they're the ones you're probably going to find. To find native milkweed, you are most likely going to, you're not going to stumble into it in your big box store. You're going to stumble into um, Asclepias persivaca in your big box store, otherwise known as tropical milkweed. And I keep reading more and more and more articles where tropical milkweed is just, they're finding more and more and more problems with it. I don't have time to get into it um, in this program, but if you look back on my other programs, I do talk about it sometimes extensively. Um, it's showing itself to possibly be invasive. It, um, the monarchs are tricked into staying in our area too long and they could freeze. And they're also passing a parasite around. And also if there's too much of that uh, tropical milkweed around. All milkweeds contain a little bit of um, toxins, which the butterflies utilize. They can ingest it and be fine. And it works for them because then other uh, species don't want to eat them because they have that little bit of poison. But if they are around too much of the tropical milkweed, they actually might ingest too much and get too much of that poison. I just, as, it seems like every week I hear another problem with the tropical milkweed. So let's really work on uh, promoting the idea that we want to buy the native milkweeds. These are the three most readily available among native plant sources. They're working on others. There are 21 native milkweeds in Florida, but um, these are the three that have so far proven to be uh, propagated successfully for commercial purposes. So look for these three. African iris, not a native, but a very nice plant and um, can look very, very nice in your rain garden. It likes kind of the wetter areas, but does do fine through the dry times as well. Swamp sunflower, there's the name swamp right there. And this can get kind of tall, like up to four feet. Very beautiful plant. And it looks great growing, you know, in mass, a lot of it together. And it is a native. The salvias, the different salvias, native salvias. Um, there's even some nice non-native salvias. Um, these, these sages attract a lot of pollinators and really look great. And they self-seed as well. Blue-eyed grass, this is really only going to bloom in the spring. Here's a close-up of it. Very cute little ground cover. It can be used like on the front or on the berm of your um, rain garden and look really great. Goldenrod, 
this can be uh, you know on the back edge because it's going to get pretty tall. No, this does not cause allergies. This is um, pollinated by insects, not really by the wind. The problem with goldenrod is it hangs out in a bag crowd. It often hangs out with ragweed and therefore gets the blame for giving us allergies when it doesn't. Um, goldenrod, and there are several different species and varieties of it, is just a nice native plant. Purple cone flower, absolutely gorgeous euchanasia, and they come in all sorts of, um, you know, uh, hybrids. But this is what the native looks like, and it it can be a wonderful uh, perennial, and bring all sorts of bumblebees and all kind of great pollinators. Wire grass. Now this might not look fabulous, but it certainly adds to the diversity of your um, rain garden and you know just brings in that filler and it uh, is a native and it will be a great addition to the rain garden. Muley grass, this is gonna get uh, you know pretty big. So if you have a large rain garden, this will fill in the space quite well. This is one of the few natives where you can go pretty much in any big box store and find it. But just make sure that there it is not being treated with any type of chemicals before you buy it. Elliot's love grass, that's a native. It grows all over um, naturally in the areas where I live in Northwest Hernando County and it transplant plants itself very well. It'll um, get like a purple hue in the um, fall and be very, very nice. Oh, I'm sorry, the purple lovegrass gets the purple hue. Elliot's lovegrass is similar to it, um, but it has more of a white kind of beigey type flowers. The purple lovegrass is what gets the, um, the purple hue. They're both very, very nice additions. Easy to care for, easy to transplant. Bacahatchee grass, now if you have a very large uh, rain garden. This will make a nice addition because it's going to get four to six feet tall and four to six feet wide. Um, this, this just, once it starts growing, it starts taking care of itself. It stays in this really nice shape here, and it's just a very attractive plant to add there. Canna lilies, there are native varieties of it. We see this, we think of this as a typical Florida plant, you know, it can come in yellow or red, easy to take care of, probably will freeze back, but it'll always come back. Blazing star, um, if you can find this in a native uh, nursery, um, a liatris, kind of, you know, what we can have, we can't really grow lavender here in Florida, but you get some of this blazing star, absolutely gorgeous and the uh, pollinators love it. It grows in the early spring. This coral bean, um, it might not look, you know, all that attractive by itself, but you add it in mass or you add it within the, you know, the palette that is your rain garden. It's going to bring those hummingbirds and just be gorgeous. Rosin weed, that's this yellow here, mixed in with the coral bean. This was actually a rain garden here. Um, again, it'll bring the pollinators, it'll bring that um, the upright type of plants to your garden. Rosemary, why not even, you know, throw an herb in there? Um, they'll probably be better along the edges because they don't like it to be uh, too wet. Rosemary doesn't but it could add you know, a nice border around the edges of your rain garden and smell wonderful. So here we'll just, as we wrap up, just look at some ideas. Some of these may be more work than you wanna do or fancier than your wallet allows, but it, it allows us to dream to window shop for these rain gardens and then to come up with a plan that we can do in our own landscape. Again, 
rocks um, are great features and you wanna use them decoratively. This one is pretty simple and easy. It's at the University of Florida. You can see this one is, you know, much more simple than that one. And, you know, they're, they just kind of already have a little swale there and they just filled in the plants and, and there you go. And they have rain barrels right next to it as well. Again, here's one that is at the University of Florida. It shows you part of the kidney shape and they're utilizing the rocks to kind of hold the water in and be decorative. Here's one that um, is, is, I guess, the water before on this big slope. All that stormwater would go directly into this lake <laughs> there. So, and all the uh, water from the roof and everything. So they, what they've done is they've created this aquifer recharge, but it's also a infiltration garden to filter what might be coming off the roof or off of the road to go and filter into the ground rather than spill right into the lake. Here's a much smaller idea. You know, if you want to have a small space, this shows you what can be done because the water probably pours off of here. Um, not sure that it's 10 feet away from the house. It's tried hard to tell from this angle, but it'll give you some ideas. Here's a couple more. This gentleman, this is, his comes into a very wide garden here. He has, one very large downspout here, and then the rocks kind of slow it down and let it filter into this, you know, this um, rain garden area. Here's someone who is using a natural already dip in their yard, um, and they filled it up with these nice flowers that are going to soak up the rain. So, in conclusion, what rain gardens do is they capture stormwater. That's their purpose. And they are everywhere. This is not just a Florida thing. I took this picture at a West Virginia rest stop and it was a very large, beautiful um, rain garden that was taking the stormwater from a mountain behind it. Um, rain gardens, they fit with the Florida friendly uh, principle of reducing stormwater runoff. And they also facilitate a positive way to solve a problem. And reduced stormwater runoff. In yesterday's class, we talked about how saving the rain, harvesting the rain, hoarding the rain in your own yard benefits you, benefits your landscape, but it also benefits the environment because every bit that you keep in your yard that you allow to filter down back into the aquifer naturally, does not become stormwater runoff, does not pick up pollutants and take it to the nearest waterway. My email again is at the bottom. If you have any questions or again, would like a PDF of this presentation, you see my email down here, lilyb at hernandocounty.us. I got a lot of this information from this booklet called Rain Gardens, a manual for Central Florida residents. So you can also find this, there's a PDF available for this online. All you have to do is Google Rain Gardens, Central Florida, UF for University of Florida. And you should be able to find this. If you can't, email me and I will send you the link to it. And this will walk you through those diagrams and those measurements and also uh, the list of plants as well. Now you don't have to use only the plants I said, um, those were just to give you ideas. And that's it, thank you for watching us today and what, learning about rain gardens or aquifer recharge gardens. And again, if you have any questions, please contact me, Lily Browning at lilyb at hernandocounty.us. Thank you and happy gardening.